Good morning, brothers and sisters. The Lord is good. We were sitting there singing just a a moment ago, and I realized I didn't have my notes with me. And so I frantically said, where are my notes? And they weren't on the front row anywhere. And so I went back to the back and told Jeff Dooley, I don't know where my notes are. They're somewhere in this room. And I was wrong about that, too, because they were out in the old portable building where I laid them down before we started moving cones. So the Lord wanted to use a humble instrument for his purposes this morning. So I'm glad that I can come and preach to you with notes now. All right. Yeah. I don't want to wing it up here, okay? Let's uh, turn in our Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, for our sermon text. 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4. Let me read the word of the Lord and let us give our hearts and minds to its focus. Peter writes, So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. May the Lord bless his people through the reading of his word. Let's pray once more. Gracious Father, now as we come to your word, please, We pray that you would draw our hearts to you by the power of the Spirit. May Christ be highlighted. May he be magnified in our hearts so that we give glory to your great name. I pray you would please help us to focus and concentrate, Lord God, our attention upon your word. Guard us from distraction so that you may be magnified in us from the inside out. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this is the fourth sermon in our church membership series. We had to take a bit of a break in this series because I got sick two weeks ago. And so Pastor Ben has um, kindly been teaching us and preaching on why we preach the way we do. And so we're coming now back to our membership series. The first week in that series, we uh, answered the question, what is the local church? And then the second week, is church membership biblical? Thirdly, we uh, asked the question, what is a church member? And finally, we're going to answer the question this morning, what is church leadership? We need to know what the Bible says about this because there have been a lot of abusive leaders throughout the centuries. They have exercised abusive church leadership in the name of Christ. And so you need to know what the standard is that we hold ourselves to as elders here. You need to know that we hold ourselves to this standard because we believe it is God's standard according to Scripture. And so we take it very seriously. We're not perfect. We, we haven't, we haven't uh, embraced this with perfection, but certainly by the power of the Spirit, we want to be faithful to this calling as elders in the local church. And so I want to be trying to answer the question along the way as we lay out kind of the job description, the character, the the motivation of elders, that you ask the question of yourselves, why do I need to know this? And I want to help you understand that. Why is it important that you know this as church members along the way? Well, to give you a little bit of context here, uh, the letter of 1 Peter is written to churches that are feeling some of the early tremors of persecution in the first century. Now, the persecution hasn't, um, hasn't spanned across the Roman Empire at this point. It's not yet physical. Uh, people aren't being um, necessarily beaten or, or killed because of of persecution in these churches and in these cities where these believers are gathering, but it's, it's more of a social 
softer persecution that they are feeling. They're being estranged. There's probably financial pressure. Perhaps they're losing employment as a result of being Christians. They're being looked down upon. And so Peter has been writing to them in this letter to remind them of God's grace. His grace as a way to encourage them in their suffering, in their trials, and then to instruct them in how to live faithfully during these difficult times. And so toward the end of the letter, he comes to this section where he is now instructing elders. It may be that he is addressing church leaders here because the people in these churches will need faithful elders to guide them and to tend to their souls as they experience more and more suffering as time goes by. In light of that, I like what Juan Sanchez in his book on 1 Peter says. He says, since the end is near and we are confronted by difficulties, it's possible that some of us may lose our heads and wander away from the faith like strange sheep. Others might not wander off, but we could be confronted with situations that are too much for us to bear alone. Where shall we find guidance if our boss at work asks us to compromise our Christian convictions? To whom do we go for help if our unbelieving spouse abandons us? Who will guide us if our son or daughter asks us to attend their gay wedding ceremony? I think that's helpful because in the midst of difficulties in in a society that is much like the society, I think, that Peter is writing into, these churches that are experiencing soft social persecution. We're starting to feel some of that here in our day and age. And so during these difficult times, who will you turn to for guidance, instruction? The answer that I think the scriptures would have us give is it should be your elders. It should be your elders. But we, as your elders here at Living Hope Bible Church, we will only be of help to you if we submit ourselves to the scriptures for our role as shepherds. So that's why we need to take very seriously texts like 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4. And Peter shows us here three things. Number one, he shows us the responsibilities of elders. Number two, he shows us the character of elders. And number three, he shows us the motivation for elders. The responsibilities, the character, and the motivation for elders. Let's go to the first point. We're going to find that in the first two verses of 1 Peter chapter 5. He says, so I exhort the elders among you, the elders. Now, this word elders is used with other words in the New Testament to describe the same church office or the same church position. You might see elders combined with uh, words like overseers or bishops, if uh, you have a different translation, or, or shepherds or pastors. But it's all referring to the same individual, these same church leaders, elders, shepherds, pastors, overseers. They can be used interchangeably. As he starts out this section of scripture, he he says a few things here that give weight to his instruction starting in verse two. First, we see Peter's humility because he calls himself a fellow elder, if you see in verse one. He's exhorting them as a fellow elder. He he doesn't throw down the apostle card again like he could have. He said that back in chapter 1. He called himself an apostle. But he doesn't do that again. He calls himself a fellow elder with the elders he's now addressing. And as such, he needs to hear the same instruction. We also see Peter's trustworthiness here because he calls himself a witness of the sufferings of Christ. Now, he wasn't at the foot of the cross, but we know that he was there. He saw the arrest. He saw the trial of Jesus. And he was also commissioned as a witness to declare the sufferings of Christ. And one author says it like this. This made Peter a trustworthy source to encourage the elders to their duty. So we see his trustworthiness as he's about to give this exhortation. And finally, we see his hope, Peter's hope. In verse 1 as well, he calls himself a partaker in the glory to be revealed. This is a needed reminder for those who are leading suffering believers. Jesus is going to return for them someday, and they need that to undergird their ministry. 
Well, these three things bring force to the exhortation that Peter gives these elders. And he starts out in verse 2 by talking about uh, the first aspect of their responsibility as elders. They are to, verse 2, shepherd the flock of God that is among them. Shepherd the flock of God. So the responsibilities first involve shepherding, which has the idea of feeding the flock and providing for their welfare. And if you're thinking about the Apostle Peter, there may be a text of Scripture that comes to mind. And in fact, it's likely that this, this experience is what is in Peter's mind as he gives this instruction. Turn with me to John chapter 21. I want you to see what may have been going through Peter's mind whenever he's writing these words about shepherding to these other elders. John chapter 21, 15 through 17. After Peter has really denied Christ three times, just like Jesus said he would, he runs away weeping because of it. But then Jesus dies and he rises again. And this is after Jesus has risen from the grave. And it's going to reveal this experience, this, this text of Scripture is going to reveal that Jesus has in fact forgiven Peter and is restoring him to ministry. But what does that have to do with shepherding? Look with me at John 21, 15 through 17. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Here, Jesus makes it clear that if Peter truly loves him, then he will shepherd his sheep. It is those who love Jesus having been forgiven by him through his death and resurrection, those like Peter, it is those who will faithfully do the work of shepherding his people, those who love him. And so as I read 1 Peter 5, I'm thinking of that as well. If I'm going to shepherd you well, if we as your elders, the seven of us, are going to shepherd you faithfully, we must love Christ first. So, shepherding, this feeding, this providing for the welfare of the sheep, how is it done? How do elders shepherd the flock of God? Well, first, we must feed you. We see that in the New Testament, the, the importance of the feeding ministry of elders to feed you, to nourish your souls. And how is that done? We see that in a couple of different places. I want to show you two of them. 2 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. Feeding ministry of elders. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Paul writing to Timothy at this point, who you could say is kind of like an interim pastor for the church of Ephesus. He says to Timothy, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. What is it that we preach? We preach the word. We don't preach our uh, traditions. We don't preach our feelings, our opinions. We preach the word. That is what's going to nourish your souls. I like what Paul says to Titus. If you just flip over a page, Titus chapter 1, verse 9, we're told this. Similarly, he must hold firm, speaking of um, those who are overseers or elders, 
he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict. We, as elders, have to hold fast to the word so that we can instruct you and, yes, even rebuke those who are teaching contrary to that word. We must feed you the word and nothing else because nothing else will nourish your souls. Matthew 4, 4, Jesus said, right, he, quoting the Old Testament, says, man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's why we need his word weekly coming from this pulpit. Can you imagine if I fed my children for every meal cotton candy? Think about, they would love it, of course. That would be great for them. But if I gave them cotton candy, let's sit down, let's have a family meal, here is your roll of cotton candy and yours. Every meal. What would we expect? We would expect that my children would have no teeth, first of all. Um, but they would be malnourished. They would be malnourished. That's what's true for those who are not fed the word of God in their churches. Things that may be entertaining to listen to, things that may be even compelling in some way, but if it's not the word, then the soul is going to shrivel. It's not going to have what it needs. We must not allow you to be spiritually malnourished, and to do so for us would be spiritual abuse if we didn't feed you what you need. You are God's flock, by the way. I want you to turn back with me to 1 Peter Notice this, shepherd the flock of God that is among you. You're called the flock of God, right? The, the flocks that these elders are, are leading, they are the flock of God. You are the flock of God. So you don't ultimately belong to us. We dare not act as if you belong to us. We must treat you as those who are beloved of God. That gives weight to our ministry. That... God is the one who has said, these are mine. Therefore, you must tend to them my way. With that in mind, I think there's another text that, that says this well, and that's Acts 20. Look with me there. We're flipping around a lot because I, I want to show you this, this is, this is uh, a reality that goes beyond 1 Peter chapter 5. Acts 20 28 through 31. Now, Paul is talking here to a group of elders. He's talking to the elders of the church of Ephesus. And this is what he says, starting in verse 28 of Acts 20. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Before we go any farther, I want, to, I want to make that point. It's a similar point to what Peter is making, which is you belong to God. Jesus obtained you by his blood. You've been bought with a price, and the price is the ultimate, infinite price of the precious blood of Jesus. Therefore, we ought to pay careful attention to you as elders. And shepherding does more than just feed. It also protects. Shepherding includes protection. And we see that as we go on here in this text. Look with me at verse 29. I know that after my departure, Paul says, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. He took it seriously, didn't he? And we need to as well. Fierce wolves. Be those even from among you that will come up, he says. And so we must protect the flock. We must positively preach and teach the truth of God's word and then call out error when we see it so that disciples will not be drawn away in their hearts and lives. This is crucial because 
you belong to God because you have been bought with the price of Jesus' blood. Do you remember what Jesus said in John chapter 10 where he, he calls himself the good shepherd? He says, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. This he did for your eternal protection, didn't he? For your eternal protection. And he sets that example for us as elders. If he died so that you would be eternally preserved and protected, what, what, what must we do as elders? How must we sacrifice for your protection as well? And sometimes that means we'll say things that are hard. Sometimes that means that we will call out error and it won't be comfortable. Sometimes it'll mean challenge. And it won't necessarily feel good, but it will be good nonetheless for your protection. Well, going on, another aspect of the responsibilities of elders includes this, if you look at verse 2, exercising oversight. Exercising oversight. It carries the idea of looking upon the sheep in order to care for them. Looking upon them in order to care for them. One author says it like this. It's clear, it's clear connotation here is that Shepherds must watch over the sheep to assess their condition so as to lead, guard, and feed them. Look upon them to assess their condition so that you can lead, guard, and feed them. Reminds me of something else that Jesus the Good Shepherd says, which is, I am the Good Shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. In a similar fashion, Elders ought to know their sheep so that they know how to lead them, how to guide them, how to feed them, how to protect them. There's a great illustration of this. I remember hearing Mark Dever, who's the pastor of Capitol Hill Baptist Church, he, saying that when he got the job for that senior pastor back in the 90s, that he uh, requested six months to observe the church. Isn't that weird? Most of us, we, they would say, no, no, you can't have that. But they gave it to him. Six months to observe the church, how they function, who they are, strengths, weaknesses. Why? Also that he would know best how to serve them. He took it seriously that he, if he was going to shepherd the flock, exercise oversight faithfully, then he would need to know them. And so he asked for six months to observe. Makes me think of how Carrie and I are always watching our children. Always watching them to, to know, okay, what do they need right now? Well, how, how do they, what do they need physically? What, what do they need spiritually? What do they need emotionally, mentally? We're watching, we're assessing so that we can direct our parenting specifically toward their needs. In a similar way. That's the way elders need to operate. And we must be among you to do that, by the way, right? Shepherd the flock of God that's among you, that, that implies that we need to be with you, right? Living with you so that we can know you, so that we can help you in the best way possible spiritually. The question is that we think about the responsibilities of elders, our responsibilities to you. My question for you is, will you receive the ministry of the elders? Will you receive it? We're not perfect. You know this. But will you receive our ministry? Or will you push back? Will you avoid? Will you put on a front as if everything's okay when it's not? Will you maintain an independent spirit? This is not our plan. This is God's plan. He has given you elders because he wants what's best for you. And so we take this seriously, and we also want you to take this seriously. And as I'm thinking about the, the, what's good for you, I'm, I'm struck by remembering Hebrews 13, 17, which says this. This, this has to do with you. L look with me at Hebrews 13, 17. The author says, Obey your leaders and submit to them. For they are keeping watch over your souls. That's shepherding ministry. As those who have to give an account, 
That's sobering for us. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Isn't that interesting? Let them do this with joy and not groaning because it wouldn't be good for you otherwise. This has to do with your spiritual welfare. We want to serve you so that you will be fed, so that you will be nourished, so that you will be protected, and you'll be better suited to glorify God in your life and the different facets of your existence. Elders. I want to... In line with that, I, I want to tell you that as one of the elders, the other elders, the other six elders, they're my elders too. You ever think about that? Ben, it's true for Ben and for Chris and for Dave and for Bob, for all of us. The other elders are our elders too. So I am to submit to them as my elders. I don't get to act as if their shepherding is not for me. I'm a member of this church too. And God gave us these verses like 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4, because elders are his provision for your good, for our good. I hope you will receive it as from the Lord. And to that end, we, uh, I've told you a little bit about this, but we are beginning a shepherding plan as your elders. A shepherding plan, we call it the, the three by one plan, or is it the one by three plan? I can't remember. One by three, three by one, I can't remember. But here's how it goes. Our goal is, as we've divided the church up among the elders, that each elder who has you know, these, you know, somewhere between 13 and 14 different individuals or family units, assign to them that everybody in that list gets prayed for at least once a week by that elder. And then contacted at least once a month by that elder. And then once a year, the goal is that that elder would gather with that individual or family. So prayed for once a week, contacted once a month, and gathered with once a year. That's the best we can come up with with, with an organized way to love you and to shepherd you and make sure that, yes, we understand who you are so that we can lead you in the best way possible for the glory of God and the health of your soul. And so I hope that you, as, as we begin to make those phone calls, as we begin to ask you, hey, come over to our house for dinner, that you'll receive this. And this will be something that, that you see as from God and praise him for so that we can all grow together and be more unified and exemplify our great king with greater clarity. Well, as we continue to think about elder ministry, church leadership, we look to the character of elders, not only the responsibilities of elders, but the character of elders. And I want you to look with me at verses two and three. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, here's where we'll start, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Peter tells us in these verses how elders are to exercise oversight, and the how reveals the character of elders. So first, he says, they are to exercise oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly. What does this mean? It means that the consistent response of elders to the sacrifice of shepherding should not be, do I have to? It shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't be kind of like begrudging. Like I have to be forced or coerced into it. That shouldn't be the response of a shepherd. Do I have to really? No. Peter's saying that elders should do the good work of caring for God's flock without being pressured, without being coerced. It should be free. Free exercise of oversight. I like the way one translation says it, not merely as a duty. And that fits, I think, with 1 Timothy 3.1. 
1 Timothy chapter 3 gives us the, um, the criteria or the qualifications for elders. And this is the way that Paul begins it. He says, if anyone aspires to the office of overseer, let him. We should aspire to it. It's not something that you're shoved into. It's not something that, that you kind of you know, kick the dirt as you walk into that ministry. No, elders should aspire to it, to do the work of shepherding, not under compulsion. And I like that it says here, as God would have you. You see that there in the text? As God would have you. This is the way that God would have elders shepherd. This is the character that he wants us to have as we help you guide you. It's God's call because it's his flock and it's it's his ministry. It's his world. I like um, the title of John Piper's book on pastoral ministry. It's called Brothers, We Are Not Professionals. That's what we aspire to, not being professionals, being shepherds. We don't do what we do because it's what the world deems best but because God says it's right, because God says it's what pleases him. And that's why we do what we do. We don't let the world call the shots when it comes to our ministry and our leadership. And Peter goes on to describe this character of shepherds. Not for shameful gain are they to exercise oversight, but eagerly. Not for shameful gain, but eagerly. So elders are not to be in it for the money. Simply put, not to be in it for the money, not to be greedy for gain. If an elder is greedy for money, then it will certainly affect the way he shepherds. And the effect it will have is that it will be detrimental to the flock. Like the way Juan Sanchez says it, he says, elders will preach the word when it's received well and when it's rejected. Why is that, what does that have to do with greediness and Shameful gain. Well, if a pastor only wants to preach that which will be well received, then there'll be a problem. If a pastor only wants to preach what's well received, if that pastor is motivated by greed toward that end, then he'll skip over the parts of the Bible that will make people feel uncomfortable. He'll only want to preach what is safe, and by that I mean what will bring people in and keep them in the seats so they'll keep tithing. It will limit severely and distort the message that comes from that pulpit because he only wants people to be comfortable so they'll stay and come for the first time and remain. See, we do expository preaching here. And one of the reasons why we do expository preaching is because it's more important that you hear all of God's truth than it is for you to feel good about everything that comes out of this pulpit. If you're always walking away just feeling happy, well, are we really preaching the word of God? Because you know what? The word of God sometimes makes us feel uncomfortable. Sometimes it challenges us. Sometimes it convicts us. Sometimes we're rebuked. So we don't want to skip over the passages that are hard and uncomfortable because we know that you need the full counsel of God. You don't just need what's going to make you feel good or comfortable, what's easy and palatable. Why don't you look with me at Ezekiel 34. Ezekiel 34 is an important text of Scripture when we're thinking about shepherding ministry because the, the teachers in Israel were not doing their jobs. Their character was severely lacking. We see that just in the first few verses of Ezekiel 34, these shepherds in Israel. Ezekiel 34, starting in verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God, ah, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves. Should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. 
shame on us if we prioritize ourselves over you and your welfare. If we feed ourselves, if we're only just thinking about ourselves and not about you, shame on us. We are not to be those who exercise oversight because of shameful gain, but eagerly for your benefit. Peter goes on, our, ex- our exercise of oversight also ought not to be domineering. We're not to be domineering, he says, over those in our charge, but being examples to the flock. What does it mean to be domineering? Well, essentially, elders are not to be spiritual bullies to their people. No spiritual bullies here. No power trips among the elders. Remember the gentle and lowly heart of Jesus that he describes in Matthew 11? He has a gentle and lowly heart. We are to have the same heart, to pray for God to make that so more and more and more in our lives. And we're also to think about Jesus' direct instruction to his disciples about their own leadership and how that speaks to not being domineering. Look at me at Matthew chapter 20. Matthew 20, starting in verse 25. Matthew 20, starting in 25. Remember, this is when... The sons of Zebedee, James and John, their mother comes before Jesus and she asked him, verse 20, for something. And he said to her, what do you want? She said to him, say that these two sons of mine are to sit one on your right and one on your left. Well, then we're told later in the text that the other disciples are angry. They're indignant at this. And this is when Jesus steps in and he says in verse 25, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That is to be the character of your elders. Those who say, I am servant of all, just like my Savior who came to earth not to be served, but to serve and to die, to give his life as a ransom for many. I am to have that character of Christ in the way that I serve you and the rest of us as they serve you. We must reflect the servant-hearted sacrifice of Jesus in our ministry. If you see us caring more about budgets and buildings than you, then we failed. May it not be so. Pray for us, brothers and sisters. Instead of domineering leadership, we must set an example for you to follow. That's what Peter says in the text. Set an example. Be examples for the flock. You should be able to look for not for perfection in us, don't look for perfection, but you ought to look to us to see how to please God in your relationships. Your relationships to your brothers and sisters in this church. You should be able to look to us to see how to please God in marriage, in parenting, in friendships, to to please God in being a good neighbor. You should see an example in us for these things. For for how to please God with our finances, or or with your time, with your job, with your career. For how to please God in suffering and in brokenness and loss. You should be able to see how to share the gospel when you look at us. Again, not perfection, but we should be able to say, imitate me as I imitate Christ. That calling causes me some trepidation, brothers and sisters. But there's grace for that as well. Well, when we look at Scripture, we don't see, as we think about character, when we look at Scripture, we don't see the priority in church leadership being given to 
a charismatic personality. You don't see that as the priority when it comes to leadership or an engaging presence or being a gifted communicator. That's not what you see the priority being given to. That's not the focus. Instead, it's, it's character. If you just look at the qualifications for eldership in 1 Timothy chapter 3, it's character, 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 character. Oh, must be apt to teach. He throws that in there, but the rest of it's character. So when you're thinking about church leadership, don't ask first, does his style resonate with me? Don't let that be the question that you ask, but rather, can I follow his life? Can I follow their lives? Can I imitate them because they're imitating Christ? That seems to be the focus and the emphasis we see in Scripture, not personality or the presence they have on the stage or the gifting and eloquence they have as a communicator. And finally, we see when we're thinking about church leadership and how it affects you and why it matters for you, the motivation of elders. Verse 4, the motivation of elders. We read this, And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Jesus here is called chief shepherd. I love that. He is chief shepherd. And so we need to remember that we are but under shepherds, under shepherds. He is our authority. He is the shepherd that we answer to. We are under shepherds as we minister to you and serve you. We are under the authority of the Lord, your Lord and our Lord. And Peter speaks of the appearing of the chief shepherd. The appearing of the chief shepherd is his return. When he comes back, Jesus came, he lived, he died, he rose again, he ascended to the right hand of the Father, he's here, there now, and one day he's going to come back. He's going to come back, and when he does, he will bring with him reward. And specifically in this text, we're told the elders will receive reward from their shepherd for their faithfulness in ministry. I think that's what Peter means when he says the unfading crown of glory. I think that there will be reward for, from the chief shepherd to the under shepherds who are faithful in their ministries. Now, this is not a reward that will be enjoyed outside of Jesus or separate from Jesus, but it will be enjoyed in him and for him. I think it's important that you know this, that this should be our motivation his reward when he returns for faithful elders. Why, is, why does that matter for you? It's important because elders can have many wrong motivations for service to the flock. Wealth, influence, reputation, approval. Some of the wrong motivations that we can have. If these are the things that an elder is striving for, it will never be enough. Never. It will never satisfy the elder. And his ministry will be unstable as a result volatile, and you will not receive the shepherding that you need because of it. But if your elders are serving for the reward of Christ, then you can be sure that no matter what happens in ministry, whether it's low numbers, low budget, unfair criticism, increasing persecution, they will continue to be faithful because the reward is not here. But it's coming from the chief shepherd. See, if it's something that's here, it'll never be enough. And they'll, the elders that seek for those rewards that are here will strive for them, but it will, it will always elude them. And you will suffer as they try to get that object of their affections. But if it's Christ, if it's him, if it's his reward, then no matter what happens here circumstantially, there will continue to be faithfulness. That matters. We must have this motivation. It's for your benefit. No matter if ministry is really hard or fairly easy, whatever the season, Jesus' reward anchors elders to faithful service 
for your good and the glory of God. So, brothers and sisters, it feels a little weird as an elder telling you about my job. But it's God's plan. Because he loves you. Because he loves these elders too. Because he loves all of us and he wants us to thrive spiritually. This is his plan. Will we submit to it? Is the question. Have you noticed that leadership in the local church looks vastly different from leadership in the world? As we think about this, that's necessary. And that is for your benefit in the glory of God. Let's rejoice as we seek to do things his way for his honor. Let's pray. Gracious God, help us now to say yes to your plan in the local church. Yes to you. Whether we are elders or we are church members under the authority of elders, let us all draw near to submission to your word because you are the one who calls the shots. You are our good God. You are the God of the universe. You are the Lord that holds holds all things together in Christ. We know that that is true. And so Father, please teach us as shepherds to be humble. Teach us to be eager for the ministry. Teach us more and more to embrace Christ-likeness. To not to be those who are forced into it, but are excited, willingly, freely moving forward into our responsibilities. And that we have a character that exhibits what Christ exhibited as he walked this earth and died the death of the cross. And may we be motivated by the reward that he comes to bring faithful shepherds all so that this body of believers will be helped, built up and supported for your great name. We pray it in Jesus.